O. K. Two simple letters combined together to make one of the most widely used and versatile words in the English language. Whether someone's talking about a meal, a hotel, a song, or a female companion who charges by the hour. If someone describes them as okay, then you can rest assured that they were acceptable, satisfactory, adequate competently average. And when I think about the word that sums up Black Adam most effectively, then OK is probably the most appropriate one I can come up with. It's a passable, inoffensive, mildly entertaining kind of movie that incorporates all the tried and tested elements of the genre and never goes too far wrong as a result, but it also never rises to any particular heights. In short, Black Adam is OK. And what's funny is that in 2022, being competently OK is like a ring fucking endorsement. I mean shit man, I certainly didn't expect much from a film that combines two of the most overused commodities in modern entertainment, superhero movies and Dwayne Johnson, who feels like he's trying to jump on the comic book bandwagon about 10 years after everyone else. And yet there I was, emerging from the movie theatre after spending two hours watching Black Adam, thinking, yeah, that was okay actually. Anyway, let's see if we can make some sense out of this one. So the story picks up a few thousand years ago in the ancient Middle Eastern nation of Kandak, where the king has enslaved the population and forces them to dig for a rare metal called adamantium, vibranium, unobtainium, mithril, Sorry, Eternium. Jesus, why is there always a fictional metal that's apparently indestructible, but is also capable of being forged into usable shapes? Lucky it only becomes super strong and indestructible once it's convenient to the plot. Anyway, whatever. The king wants the Eternium so he can construct a magical crown that'll give him the power to take over the entire world. Because, you know, why wouldn't you? But before he can finish his dastardly work, a slave boy leads a revolt against him, and for his courage, he's awarded the power of Shazam, which turns him into a virtually indestructible superman named Teth Adam that can overthrow Kandak's evil oppressors. The king is duly defeated, the crown is hidden away, and Teth Adam vanishes from history. Skip forward to the present day and Kandak is once again in the shit. This time they've been invaded by a foreign mercenary force known as Intergang. Because it's an international gang, I guess. You don't say and they want to strip mine the country for Eternium. Hmm, an impoverished Middle Eastern country that ends in Ak that's been invaded by a foreign power intent on exploiting their precious natural resources? Is that a reference to something? Anyway, this is where the action picks up with local archaeologist and all-round hot girl Adriana, who knows the Intergang is close to finding the crown, and so she's determined to get there first to keep it safe. She manages to find its final resting place, but oh no, they're ambushed by Intergang, and in an act of desperation, she releases Teth Adam from his slumber. And well, he wastes absolutely no time fucking up the Intergang troops that get in his way. Pretty soon, word of his return reaches Amanda Waller back in the States, and since she's well aware of the danger of having a rogue superpowered entity with godlike powers just wandering around, she activates the Justice Society to bring him in. Not the Justice League, mind you, because the studio's still trying to figure out what which of them are actually worth keeping. Some more than others, I suspect. Anyway, the Justice Society head out to Kandak with instructions to bring Teth Adam in, dead or alive. Naturally, he's not particularly keen on either option, which results in fighting. Lots of fighting. But while all this fighting's going on, evil traitor man gets his hands on the magic crown, turns into a big magical demon thing and opens a portal to hell. You know, just an average day in DC land I suppose. Will the Justice Society manage to join forces with Teth Adam to take down their real enemy, or is it game over for planet Earth? I said at the start of my video that Black Adam incorporates all the tried and tested elements of a superhero movie, and fuck me, it's practically a laundry list of comic book tropes. Ancient enemy reawoken in the present day? Check. Fish out of water story as an alien hero has to adapt to the modern world? Check. Diverse team of heroes who have to learn to put aside their differences and work together to overcome a bigger threat? Check. Climactic CGI battle scene? Check. Army of copy-pasted minor enemies for the human characters to fight? 
check. All of these things are present and correct in Black Adam, and while it's not inherently bad to give your audience what they expect, it also means that the film isn't exactly heavy on tension and intrigue. It's more like watching a cover band doing a decent version of your favourite songs. You know exactly what's coming, and the only variation is in the execution. That being said, one of the big questions that hangs over the movie is whether or not Black Adam is actually good or evil, and it's an interesting one because The Rock isn't exactly known for playing dark, edgy characters. I mean, he admits himself that he's not a hero, and later revelations about his history definitely back this up, but he never really turns to the dark side either. At worst, he kills a few soldiers that he probably could have spared, but to be fair, they were trying to kill him first, so he's not exactly Homelander here. I get the feeling that they could have crafted Black Adam into a much more menacing, terrifying character where you genuinely didn't know what he was going to do from one scene to the next, but instead they kind of lost their balls and played his brutality mostly for laughs. You know he's never going to do anything particularly bad to anyone who doesn't deserve it, and I don't know if it was a studio decision or just The Rock wanting to maintain his brand. The movie also hints at the idea that Eternium can damage him if it's used as a weapon, but aside from a few minor injuries early on, the script never really does much with it, and as a result, I never once felt like he was in danger. Yeah, I know he's basically Superman in a different form, but even Superman had Kryptonite to deal with. As for the other characters, the script is a weird mix of different approaches, either trying to do too much with too little, or setting up things that don't really go anywhere. Like, there's a lot of references to a long and close friendship between Hawkman and Doctor Fate, and while Aldous Hodge and Pierce Brosnan are both great actors who play well off each other, there's not really enough backstory to their relationship to get the audience invested in it. Atom Smasher and Cyclone are both likeable enough, and holy fuck, it's almost a novelty to see a male-female relationship that doesn't start out with an arrogant and abrasive woman looking down on the man in absolute contempt for being a useless idiot. There's mutual respect and interest in each other's history right off the bat, and you never get the impression that the script is trying to undermine one character to elevate the other. Take note, Marvel. The downside though is that while they're pleasant enough to watch, neither one of them is really given much to do. They get to pitch in a bit during the battles, but they've got no real involvement in the main storyline, and I can't shake the feeling that they probably could have been cut in favour of Flesh Knight Hawkman and Doctor Fate. It's the same deal with Adriana, who gets a decent introduction as a Lara Croft type adventurer who hunts for ancient relics, and the actress looks pretty capable in the role, but she kind of fades into the background as the movie progresses, and it's a shame because it feels like there's a lot of untapped potential there. The world building is another issue. Intergang seems to operate like an independent state, to the point where they can invade entire countries, and nobody seems to give a shit about it. But where exactly did they come from? Who controls them? What are their goals and objectives? Don't know. And what about the Justice Society? Why have we never heard of them until now? What were they doing during the events of Man of Steel? Or Batman vs Superman? Or Justice League? Don't know. And it's funny thinking about Justice League now, because in some ways Black Adam suffers from a lot of the same problems, only to a lesser degree. Trying to introduce new characters and factions with long and apparently eventful histories, but not really providing enough setup to make them land. If I understand the studio politics correctly, it's basically there to act as a soft reboot of the DCEU, vaguely acknowledging past events, but focused more on setting up new characters and storylines to carry forward into the next phase. And in that respect, at least, I think it kind of succeeds. It ditches the divisive identity politics that are slowly suffocating the MCU, which probably explains why the professional shills absolutely hate it, and it brings in a bunch of new heroes played by capable actors that are mostly pretty likeable. And weirdly, for a movie looking towards the future, it feels very much like a throwback to the earlier, simpler, less politically motivated days of superhero flicks. And that's perfectly fine by me. By all accounts, Black Adam is the bellwether for David Zaslov's leadership at Warner. If it goes down in flames, then so does he, which probably explains why they've been advertising the shit out of this one. Because if it succeeds, then he'll have a free hand to reshape DC on film as he sees fit. And honestly, I kinda hope that he does. Black Adam might not be the triumphant success they wanted it to be, but if this is what we can expect from DC moving forward, then well, I'm okay with that. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now.